Uh, good afternoon and, and welcome. My name is Roger Mark. This is uh, an I direct our programs on global sustainability and resilience here at the Wilson Center. I know that many of you are familiar with the center. We are the living memorial to President Wilson, and we serve as a nonpartisan policy forum tackling global issues through independent research and, and open dialogue. And I'm, I'm particularly pleased of, uh, about the topic for this afternoon's discussion, building a case for integrated development, identifying and answering key research questions. And I sort of look back at that and say, do we still need to build a case? <laughs> but yes, we do. So building a case for integrated development, really, really important. Um, and I think this is really a, a salient topic for us to be examining at the Wilson Center and particularly for our program on global sustainability and resilience. Some of you are aware that our program is composed actually of four programs here at the Wilson Center. Our Environmental Change and Security Program, our Maternal Health Initiative, our China Environment Forum, and our Urban Sustainability Lab. So quite a range of issues, topics, research, analysis, programmatic innovations, and policy directions. And a recent external evaluation of our programs described us as a silo buster. <laughs> and this is exactly what we want to talk about today, the importance of silo busting across a range of key development priorities and how do you do that? What are the, the um, benefits of doing that? What do we learn from doing that? What are the challenges? And I'm also pleased that most recently, our program and the Woodrow Wilson Center was recognized by the University of Pennsylvania as the number one think tank globally for transdisciplinary research. So also an important um, theme that we will cover today. And I know very often those of us who operate in these circles talk about transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, even the terms to talk about reaching across silos are, are charged um, from, from many perspectives. So I'm, I'm very excited that this afternoon we can approach this question looking at the base for integrated research and, and approaches through research um, and to talk a little bit about the Locust Research Agenda and to get perspectives from others who are uh, thinking about integrated development from a donor perspective, from an implementer perspective, a researcher perspective, and to have a sense of how um, this all, all comes together. So as we move to the panel and we think about integrated development, I wanted to start by asking you, the panelists, if you could um, tell us why you think integrated development is, is important, what do we still need to learn about integrated development, and what does it mean in terms of your organization as you think of, of challenges and opportunities in that space. And we'd actually like to start with uh, Nanette Barkley, who's the Director of Results and Management of PACT, and she's held similar monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning positions. Um, prior to being at PACT, at PLAN and at PSI. And she was formerly a professor for 10 years, teaching courses in public health, medical anthropology, research methods, and African studies. And I know we've talked a little bit about the fun and joy of doing transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary research from an academic perch, but also moving that into the um, NGO sector. So Nanette, what are your thoughts? Why is integrated development important? What are we learning and what does it mean for you um, within the context of um, LOCUS? Thank you very much. And I just wanted to say that I'm very pleased to be here on behalf of the LOCUS Research Working Group. I'm here not only in my role as Research and Measurement uh, Director for PACT, but I'm also here on behalf of the LOCUS Group, which is a consortium of 12 organizations that are working together uh, across integrated development. And so my job on this panel is to talk about the, the research agenda that we've come up with. And I'm happy to say that you can pick it up at the back of the room. Um, <clears throat> so it, 
you'll let me, Roger Mark, I'll talk a little bit about the process mm -hmm. that we went through to develop the research agenda and um, the working group within the Locust Coalition uh, worked quite hard. First, we looked at all of the research that our organizations were doing or had done to study the impact and to do research on the integrated approach to development. <coughs> We found some gaps and we decided that what we needed to do was come up with a research agenda together as locus rather than as individual organizations. So we brainstormed on questions, research questions that we wanted to have answered. We, we did a, we like to say an adapted Delphi method uh, uh, to come up with the research questions that are in this agenda. Um, we really needed to prioritize because there were so many questions that had to be answered, that, that still need to be answered, if you will, with solid, rigorous research um, on the integrated approach to development. And so we had to prioritize. We, our working group met several times by phone, in person, to come up with the questions. We put together a survey, I think, in fact, the panelists or someone from their organizations answered the survey. We asked people who, uh, were uh, surveyed to rank these research questions and to tell us what they felt were the most important ones because obviously there are so many we we can't answer them all simultaneously. Uh, so that was our our process. Then we came together as a working group and had a workshop to look at the data that we generated through the survey, came up with the research agenda. You can see in here there are four top questions that were most highly ranked. And then we also um, have listed all of the other ones. <clears throat> and before I go into those top four questions, I wanted to just briefly say that the reason we came up with this research agenda is not so that the members of LOCUS can do research on these topics, but it's so that uh, academics, researchers who are not academically based, uh, funders, other implementing organizations, um, anyone really can take this research agenda uh, locus.ngo, I think, is the website where you can find it too if you need it, um, and and run with it. We hope that you'll let us know if you're going to do research uh, on one of these questions because we want to bring it together. Um, the the job really of the Locus members and of the the research working group specifically is to consolidate and to bring together all of this knowledge. So we w we want to be. Uh, collaborative, we want to be um, advocates also for the research. And so that's what we're, um, we see as our role. <coughs> so the four top questions here, I'll just briefly summarize, um, and not to take up too much time from the other panelists. Uh, so when is integration the most appropriate approach to use when you're doing integrated development? Because we know that it's not always the most appropriate approach, and we need to decide early on um, in what context can it be done in an integrated approach? Um, how is it best done, et cetera? <coughs> Excuse me. Number two. Sorry, I have a cold. I'm going to try to not cough into the microphone too much. Uh, what are the costs of doing an integrated approach? A lot of people say it costs more to do multiple, to work in multiple sectors in the same project. We know at PACT, for example, that we have to bring together lots of different partners and so we have costs associated with that. It also takes a lot of time to get people on the ground mobilized and working together. Um, and so what is the, what are the costs in terms of the do, doing uh, development in an integrated way? The third question is what do local community members and what do local stakeholders think of the integrated approach? What is their perspective? Are they um, do they understand that this is one project doing work across health, education, wash, environment, uh, livelihoods, et cetera? Um, so what is the ground level perspective, if you will? And then fourth, are integrated program results more sustainable? So all this work that we've put in up front to bring people together to break down some of these silos, um, are. Do the, does that result then in longer term sustainability of the results? Um, so those are the top four questions that we came up with as a working group. There's more, as I said, in the brochure. Um, <coughs> but uh, those are the, the ones that were ranked the highest. 
Um, you'll see some in the brochure are related to some of the ones I've just summarized for you. Um, but I'm going to take just a few minutes now to talk about what PACT is doing. I'm going to take off my Locus Research Group uh, hat and put on my PACT uh, results and measurement cap and, uh, and just talk about one project we have where we're intentionally generating information that can be part of this uh, database, if you will. Uh, we're feeding as, a, as, an, as an implementing partner of projects. Um, I think we're the only one, well, no DAI, but uh, uh, we're, we're feeding information into this locus uh, bank of information. So we have a project in Myanmar that started in 2011. It's called Shato. It's funded by USAID. And uh, it's just been extended through 2018. Uh, Shato works in about 2,000 villages across various parts of Myanmar or Burma, as some people call it still. Um, it works in the dry zone in Yangon. It works in Kaya State. And then just in the last few years, we've started to work in the southeast. <coughs> and Shato is a really interesting project uh, for us. It's one of our most integrated projects at PACT. And uh, it works in livelihoods. It works in food security, nutrition, health, um, numbers of uh, so many I can't even name them but I wanted to just bring it up because and explain the project to you for a minute and then tell you about the research we're doing on it and how that feeds into this other research agenda that we're talking about today. Um, the key thing for Shato is that we work through village development committees and so we work through uh, local organizations that are representative of the citizens and we give them latitude to make decisions about what they want to do first and how they want to prioritize. So we work with them to strengthen the Village Development Committee as an organization, but then we also work through them to give grants. So for example, the wash work that we do is all through grants given to Village Development Committees. And then the Village De Development Committee members and then the wash subgroup of the VDC implement those wash projects. Same uh, goes with health and other things. But a lot of things that PAC does is, is about strengthening these organizations, these VDCs, in the case of this project in Myanmar. So making sure that there are women on the VDCs, making sure that they have minutes of their meetings, making sure that they're, they're open to input from the community, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of evaluating or doing research on the Shato project in Myanmar, we've done the standard baseline and uh, in 2012, we did a midterm evaluation of it in 2014. And we tried to work with the baseline consultants, it was an external uh, evaluation, to look at integration. We said, we want you to look at all of these indicators that we have, but then we also want you to look at how we're doing in terms of integration. And they just couldn't do it. So what we've decided now is to have a separate evaluation of the integration of the Shato project. So um, luckily USAID in their extension of the project to 2018 said we want PAC to consolidate the integration of the Shato project. For the, for the next two years we want you to focus on that. So what we've done is we've put together a t terms of reference that we're um, tendering now for an organization that will do a uh, baseline, if you will, of a project that started in 2011, but a baseline as of 2016, looking at integration. And how is it that PACT Myanmar and our partners are doing this project, and what are the effects that we're having? So we want them to be open to not just the indicators that we have already data on, but also to look at the process of integration. And then in 2018, we'll do the final um, we'll do the final evaluation uh, of the integration piece of the Shato project. So, <clears throat> so that's just one example that I wanted to share with the, the, the group today about how we're contributing to the evidence base. And I'll give one example. Uh, I didn't mention education. It's not one of the things that we're working on in Shato, but we think that it's going to be an outcome of all of the work we're doing. So as children are spending less time collecting water, and as um, people's households are uh, earning more money, and as um, other things are changing within these 2,000 villages, we believe that more children will be going to school. 
So we've asked them, that's one of the 10 things that we've asked in this TOR. Um, we've asked them, uh, the, the consultant to, the evaluation consultant to look at. And so then we can use that information to contribute to the evidence base that is very much in line with the LOCUS research agenda. So I'll stop there. Okay. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Nanette. I think it's um, it's it's good to have a very concrete example from Myanmar uh, um, that demonstrates a little of what what Lucas is trying to do. I, I'm going to push you again on the the original <laughs> question. Uh, oh, I have to I'm answer that. Not, one. not <laughs> sure I got my answer okay. to that. But but why why integrated development to start with? Why did this make sense? Why did the Locust members decide that they needed to come together on this? But wh why integration? Why not keep it separate? Well, integration is at the heart of Locust. So uh, the integrated approach is really what brought these organizations together to form the Locust Coalition. Um, I can speak for the research group. Um, we recognized as organizations as and as as, as the research uh, working group that we needed better data and data on a variety of questions but we didn't really know what those questions were so that's why we started out by building a research agenda okay. does that um, and, and, answer and, your question and so for pact mm -hmm. why why an integrated approach why, so you talk of this example in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. Why is it beneficial to be looking at these different development components? Your example, for example, of looking at, at children and, and uh, less time collecting water and mm -hmm. more children going to school. What, what's the added advantage of bringing an integrated approach to looking at those questions? Well, for PACT, it, it, it was an evolution, I believe, over time. I've only been at PACT a year and a half. I can not speak on behalf of PAC for the last 45 years, but uh, PAC started out bringing together local organizations mm -hmm. and working through them and working through community-based organizations, civil society organizations. And um, in fact, PAC delivers very few services directly. We work almost entirely through organizations, uh, local NGOs, village development committees, et cetera. And so from them, we know that their communities have many needs yeah. and it's not just one they don't just need health and they don't just need education or wash or uh, resilience to climate change. They need a whole host of things. And so PACT, uh, because of our work through civil society and, and organizations and local community groups, we know that it's not, that, that, that development is, isn't happening just in one sector. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, Jason, I'd like to go, go to you next, sure. if that's okay. So, I'm, I'm quite intrigued because you are the integration lead with the cross-sectoral program division in USAID's Center of Excellence in Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance. I'm going to say that again. Oh. <laughs> the integration lead with the cross-sectoral program. This is very interesting to me. Right. Um, so, Jason's leading efforts to integrate DR principles and approaches to the strategy, design, and implementation of programs across USAID, and he also contributes to the design of the Applied Political Economy Analysis Framework and leads this uh, workshops around that framework. So, um, Chase, what are your thoughts on, on integration? How, um, from your role at USAID, how are you looking at this? What are the opportunities and challenges? So to answer your first question about why integration, um, I don't think integration is important. I think it's much more vital than that. We've, um, USAID as an agency has seen the data lead us places where we recognize that we need more impact, that we need more cost effectiveness. We need more results mm -hmm. for the money we're spending. And we, we hear it all the time, you know, there was a great, um, environmental uh, program in a marine protected area, let's say, but then we didn't consider the policy implications, a new law passed, and boom, the whole thing tanked. And I think there's, at USAID at least, we have a lot of people who are working on a lot of different things who realize that we need each other a bit more. And that's what integration is, basically. Um, so from my position in the DRG Center, what I focus on and what our team focuses on is on DRG integration. 
So we can talk about democracy, human rights, governance. There's another way to think about it. It's participation, inclusion, transparency, and accountability. And we call that PETA uh, for short. That's an acronym that uh, actually works. So, the, so for us, integration is vital for the health of all of the work that we do all over the world. Um, now, we've undertaken our own research effort and the first thing we we have a learning agenda ourselves mm -hmm. and not to you know steal your thunder but we have we have our learning agenda which i'll talk about in a minute but we've already completed a research effort we did six case studies all around the world where integrated programming was already happening that's another reason why integration people are doing it they didn't need some muckety muck from washington leading a process to tell them to do integration they understand that it's important for the work they're doing, and so they went ahead and did it already. So we found six places where this was happening in Rwanda and Ethiopia and Malawi and Indonesia and Nepal and Guatemala. Mm. And we surveyed them extensively. We went out to the field. We did a lot of interviews, and we learned a great deal about how integration was taking place, and we really identified some trends. And, and most glaringly, we learned a lot about the challenges that our officers face out there. First and foremost is the initiatives and the earmarks. These are huge, huge pots of money mm -hmm. that demand a great deal out of the teams in the field that are implementing them. Mm -hmm. And officers who are looking to optimize their results are looking to the other sectors at the mission where they sit and hoping to draw on some of that expertise in order to enhance their own programming. The problem is, is that the restrictions both perceived and real around these initiatives and earmarks are quite daunting for our officers to get around. And so we're working with them very closely to come up with some kind of guidance that may help them navigate these choppy waters. And the perceived restrictions are just as dangerous as the real ones because, you know, oftentimes it comes down to nothing more than trust and personal relationships out there in the field. And so combating these perceived restrictions is very important. We've uh, Related to that is if you want to have integrated program USAID, you're looking at different what we call flavors of money. So if you want to combine economic development money with PEPFAR money, that's not as easy. It's not all green, so to speak. <laughs> so ha teaching our officers about how to navigate that and also getting the leadership buy-in about what's okay and what's not, that's another challenge that we face. Um, so there's a lot of guidance that our people need and we, we really want our research agenda and yours to, to help us with that. Um, now, you talked earlier, Roger, about busting those silos and, and I hate to break it to you, but those silos are not gonna get busted. All right, they, they're, they're there for a reason. And, you know, the core reason why they're there is, is just an organizational principle. You, you have to be able to, to organize all this money and all these, and all these regulations. However, I think another way we can look at it is making the silos a little more permeable. The membranes that separate them, if we can let knowledge and information and data and learning pass more easily through them, it won't really matter if they're siloed or not because we're working together and we're sharing information across the silos. And I think that's what's really important. And finally, I want to reiterate, it's so, so much of this has to do with trust, personal relationships, and leadership. We can talk ourselves blue in the face about data and about technical solutions, but you need to be able to look your colleagues in the eye and you have to say, hey, I know you are under this amount of pressure and you need to deliver these results. I can help you do that. So w we do need data to help us make that case to people, and then we still need to focus on the trust and the personal relationships. It's very, very important. Mm -hmm. So what do we want to learn? Well, we think DRG as a sector is a bit different. We're not so much interested in, we're not so much interested in service delivery. It's more about institutional arrangements. It's more about local solutions. In DRG, we understand that development is political and development is a contested space where we need to compete in that contested space. 
power and coalitions and the relationship between those things is very, very important, not just to our sector, but to all the development work that our agency does. So we, you know, there's a community of practice out there around thinking and working politically, and we see this as essential to the integration effort. I think that if you think and work politically, I think integrated solutions are just going to come up and hit you right in the face as the way to move forward. So in the way our team sees it, integration, thinking and working politically, political economy analysis, these are all part of the same effort. So we think of DRG as the catalyst. We think of DRG as something that can spark greater impact in all the other sectors. So whether we're trying to integrate DRG with environment, with global climate change, or whether health is trying to integrate with education, we don't think it matters. We think that DRG has a role to play in that. So that's what informs our research agenda. We have, uh, we have a great team on our learning team, and they've, they've uh, gone out to the field. They've gone out to the agency, and they've developed a few questions. And the one question in particular that the integration team is very, very interested in is, when PETA elements, that, remember that's participation, inclusion, transparency, and accountability. When PETA elements have been implemented in non-DRG programming, how do those outcomes change? Mm -hmm. Do they change a lot? Do they change a little bit? Do they change positively or negatively? This is what we're, we really, really want to know because I think then, A, we can build a case, and B, we can tailor our engagement with these other sectors to really optimize what they're doing. Now, right now, we have a working group at the University of Pittsburgh. They are doing a review. They're going to present the results of that review um, in a public event. And in that, in that presentation, we're going to hear about the, where the consensus is about what the issues are and where the gaps are, what we know that we don't know. And then the DRG, DRG Center will, will fund research to help fill those gaps. And so for our part, that's a, very, that's a very important research effort that we need to undertake mm -hmm. in order to be of more value to the rest of the agency. So, you know, thinking about all this and thinking about how to maximize the opportunities around integration and how to really turbocharge, in a certain sense, the work that's being done in the field all over the world, I think we need to look a little bit further and ask ourselves, what does success look like? Because I find myself in meetings with people trying to persuade them and convince them about the work they're doing, talking about integration like it's the end all and be all to mm -hmm. development, but it's not. I don't even think that integration is the end goal. We need to find a way to do development differently and whether or not you prescribe specifically to that, that particular community of practice doing development differently. I think integration will allow us to do development differently. I think integration will will create new types of programming mm -hmm. that will be more effective, that will be more impactful, that will be more cost effective. So not only do we need to think about integration as something that we need to study greater and that we need to apply to programming, but then what sort of institutional arrangements do we need to, to be built up around this new paradigm? What sort of management architecture mm -hmm. are we going to need for that new reality? I think even though we're not there yet, and this is, I wouldn't call this nascent at all, uh, integrated, integrated programming has been around for a while, but I really think there's some momentum here. Um, I, I think while we're pushing our agenda, I think we need to cast ourselves a little further into the future. Um, right now, so the, there is the cross-sectoral programs team in the DRG Center, but we're working with agency leadership to, to create an integration lead that will help coordinate all the efforts all across the sectors. And I think that'll be very, very important, not just from a practical standpoint, but also from sort of the perspective of leadership by putting that flag down there. I think that'll mean a lot to the implementer community. And we're also working on how we can allow our officers to better manage adaptively. Uh, what sort of mechanisms do we need to to allow them to be more iterative? So as we as as programs are integrated, they're going to change and they're going to be in flux. And if we're thinking and working politically, then we can start to iterate a little more quickly. And we need the mechanisms in place to do that. 
So that's that's where that's where USAID is right now. Great. Thank you very much, Jason. I think very interesting. I wonder whether you could talk more about, so in your context of talking about challenges, you talk about initiatives and earmarks and restrictions and perceived restrictions. Yeah. And you talk um, about that in the context of trust and personal relationships and how that is so important. Could you give a specific example of this perceived uh, restriction so we have a better sense of what you mean by that? Sure, sure. Well, if you take one one of our biggest and most successful interventions is PEPFAR. Um, PEPFAR has done a lot of good work all over the world in a relatively short amount of time. Now, however, our officers are starting to bump up against the limit of what they can do. Mm -hmm. And that's not good enough for them, that's not good enough for the mission, and that's not good enough for the U.S. government. So they're trying right now to negotiate around the restrictions around PEPFAR about how you can spend the money, what sort of activities you can spend it on, and then how you record the results. There, th I have officers out there in the field dealing with 70 to 80 indicators that they need to report on quarterly for one program. And that's a lot of work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about trust, I come in, I say, hey, can we integrate some policy reform here or maybe a little civil society coalition building here? And they say, okay, but then I have to report on even more indicators. <laughs> and how do I know? I need a direct line of sight to my results. How do I know this isn't going to set me back, that, that maybe my management LOE or maybe that of my partners is not going to be defrayed across too many things, and we're not going to be able to see the results that we're already seeing. I mean, that's, that's where trust comes in. It, you know, do no harm is an important principle in development, but that also applies to the officer in the field. I can't do any harm to their portfolio and to, to what they need to show to their bosses. Right. So that's where trust comes in. So I, I wonder if you could, um, you, you, so you're the integration lead, and, and I think of folks who have a similar role to what I perceive your role to be in other um, situations. And I wonder whether you could, do you consider yourself a disruptor? Are you an <laughs> enabler? Are you a facilitator? How, what, what's your role really, and how does this, applied political economy analysis framework that you work with right. help in that process? That, that's a great question. So I think facilitator is the word. Um, I'm not, you know, my role and then my team's role, who, and they work very m much more focused on individual bureaus and sectors. It's not about convincing people to change everything they're doing. Right. I, the solutions are there. The management structures are there. It's all about brokering that information and putting it all together. That's what's important. W we have champions everywhere. The champions we know about, the champions uh, that, um, that we work with very closely, and then there's the champions out there that we haven't met yet. So there's plenty of people out there willing to, to integrate their programs. And there's plenty of people in leadership who see this as a new way forward. It's not our job to disrupt anything. It's our job to bring those people together, put them in the same room, give them the research and the data that they need so they, they, can, uh, they can go forward. Now, in terms of PEA, we really think that if people consider the political economy of their context, and believe me, they already do. We just provide them with the framework on how to organize all those ideas that they already have. We feel that if a group of people at a mission are thinking and working politically, if they go through the PEA training and learn about the framework, then they're just going to run straight into integrated solutions. And it's not going to seem like they're being disrupted. It's going to seem like, oh, this is a new path forward. We are banging our head, heads against the wall. You know, our CDCS was doing great, but not quite as great as we wanted it to do. I think. PEA is a way to sort of unlock those doors of the mind and of, 
you know, in terms of different offices working together in the mission to sort of pursue these new new ideas. The new ideas are already out there. They're not our ideas. We just we just are trying to facilitate people so that they can they can act upon those ideas that they have. Great. Great. Thank you very much. So, Jim, I'd like to, to come uh, to you now. You are the chief of party for the Bridge Project at Development Alternatives, Inc., and you um, have spent more than 35 years working on technical and project management in a variety of settings in Asia, the Near East, Europe, Eurasia, and Africa. You have worked for USAID and other donor-funded projects and bring technical expertise across a range of disciplines from environmental policy policy, climate change, adaptation, knowledge management, protected areas management, and ecotourism, resource governance, institutional development, capacity building have also touched on gender, disadvantaged group, renewable energy, natural resource economics, and environmental compliance. <sighs> Okay, a lot there. But, but um, Jim, as, as Jace was speaking, you kept nodding your head and, and smiling, and so I suspect you have a lot to share, too. What are your perspectives? I do. I want to uh, address your questions in order. Um, first of all, I'm really happy to be here. This is a, a, one of my favorite topics. I work in the environment and re renewable energy for most of my career, and those fields are inherently integrated. Um, and so I, I feel very comfortable in this setting. Um, I work especially in rural areas. Um, and you go down to a village or any community, and there is no Department of Public Works, there's no Department of Agriculture, there's no Department of Education. Households are inherently integrated in how they address the world, and they have to be, uh, especially in rural areas, but also in urban areas, they have to be able to adapt to sudden risks uh, and threats, and so they need to have lots of different skills and lots of different alternatives. So if you're going down there with your one single sectoral project, and you say, we're here, we're the government, we're here to help, <laughs> it's most likely that you won't succeed very well. Um, so you, you always begin with going to where they are um, and identify what their needs are. And at the organizational level, what the project, bridge project we've been working on with the Forestry and Biodiversity Office at USAID, one of the key challenges we face is going to where the other sectors are mentally. I don't, I don't mean that n denigratedly. I mean, they're their, their biases, their language, their terminology, their uh, framework of knowledge. And uh, so that, and, and that can be very different and is oftentimes very different from sector uh, office to sector office. So that when it comes to trying to do um, integration, you have that challenge of being able to communicate as well as the trust issue that Chase mentioned. Um, why is it important? Well. The other thing I wanted to bring up was that, as Jace was saying, and, and uh, the other speaker as well, is that a lot of people are already doing it. Uh, the sustainable development goals are all integrated goals. Uh, a lot of the work in the, even in the Convention on Biodiversity is trying to mainstream biodiversity conservation into other sectors. So just standing back from it and, s and pretending it is not happening is, is both pointless and also uh, self-defeating. Uh, I'd like to give a more concrete example uh, in this respect. The uh, one of the most important series of value chains in that the Bureau for Food Security deals with are these value chain value chain chains in uh, basic staple crops and other crops. And about 60 to 70 percent of those are pollinated crops. If you do away with the refugia where the pollinators live, the birds, the insects, the bats, and other uh, 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 pollinators by cutting down the forests and, or, or, or taking out other areas of the natural environment where they live, you won't have any pollinators. And we already realize this in this country where we have monoculture in the Midwest and the and, and use of overuse of certain chemicals, and the pollinators are disappearing, particularly the honeybees. So, it's not a question of, gee, wouldn't it be nice to integrate across sectors? It's actually essential um, for, that, that, for that particular sector's goals to be achieved. And, and I was talking with one of my team members the other day, and, and one of the questions was, in, to answer your organizational implication question, how do you know when you've succeeded? And to, answer to build on what Jace was saying, her answer was, 
when you won't have any integration projects at all because the other sector will have incorporated all of the things that you want to have integrated already in their project designs and implementation strategies and monitoring systems. So in other words, the, the sectoral boundaries disappear in a way or become more like osmosis the way you were describing your semi-permeable membranes there. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so from the standpoint of importance, uh, uh, in terms of the integration, again, it's it's happening. And people realize it's cost effective, and I, I, I sort of somewhat take issue. Not really that your your point, but there is an argument that it costs more. Um, it takes more time, but you have to look at the alternatives mm -hmm. um, because those cost even more in terms of lost opportunities or actual failures, mm -hmm. and. They may, they may end up taking more time in making up for the damages that were caused by not factoring in integration in the first place. Having said that, it is possible for uh, organizations like USAID and other donors to be overly integrated, to put on one particular project so many different sectors and, and, and actors that the project is a mile wide and an inch deep mm -hmm. and really can't accomplish very much because they're trying to do through no fault of their own, I'm talking about the implementing partner now, which is my perspective, through no fault of their own, they're, they're stuck with an, an, an impossible design. And this is where I think we need to really, for integrated projects in particular, it's essential that we build in collaborating, learning, and adapting approaches because those are necessary to build into the design right from the very beginning to say, and of course we need the, the acquisition uh, models to be able to do this properly. But to be able to constantly look at what you're doing, going back, shifting the design a little bit, where are the things that of that 18 sector integration project you got? Maybe there's two or three that are really working out well. Let's focus on those and maybe have the others addressed through other mechanisms. Um, what do we need to learn? Uh, well, I, I go back to what was said about evidence. The the more that we focus on the on evidence that's being generated, not just through our own projects, but through other organizations that are doing systematic analyses. So in, in the field that I work in, the uh, collaboration for environmental evidence uh, is a very important body. They do systematic analyses of evidence across the board to, s to, to identify gaps and strengths in the, in the uh, evidence base, and we need more of those like that. I would also say, in terms of, in terms of organizational implications, the large contractors, uh, what they don't do enough of is to look across the many projects that they implement, let's say for USAID, and do their own synthetic learning of what's worked for them. It would be beneficial to them in terms of producing better proposals or marketing or whatever, but to have a learning function in these contractor organizations that are doing that, you can't expect necessarily to be funded by the donor, but it's for their own good that would present a better product in terms of, or service, I should say, um, and I think that would be worth uh, doing for these, for these large firms particularly that, that can afford to do it. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so Jim, how, how long has the bridge project been going on? Um, it's been going on for about a year. We okay. started in uh, August of uh, last year and it goes for five years. Goes for um, five years. And we'll be looking at case studies in USAID missions. Uh, we'll be looking at other sectors here in Washington, five in uh, particular, uh, climate change, health, economic growth, food security, and democracy and governance. Um, and then looking across other organizations to look at where the evidence is for integration. So one of the things that um, I, I wanted to ask you, and, and Nanette and a few other colleagues and I were talking about this a little earlier, you know, for, there are many young people who are looking at, at graduate study, mm -hmm. and, and they look at, at someone like you who is doing this work on the ground, and they say, I want to do that too. And very often they come to me and they say, Roger Mark, so I've, I've completed my undergraduate, I've done my internships at PAC, and the Wilson Center, and I want to think about a course of graduate study. And as a career, I know I want to do this integrated approach, but 
I'm a little bit worried about whether I should pursue a course of graduate study that has an integrated focus. What advice do you give to a young person who is thinking of graduate school and how he or she might be able to deliver in this space where integration is so important? What kind of training is important for, for other young people who are coming up who'd like to be able to do, do this work? What, what do you know now that you wish you knew and learned when you were at graduate school? Well, I'm probably not a typical case. Uh, I first started doing integration because I was a Peace Corps volunteer in a rural village in Africa. Uh, and that got me grounded, first of all, in international development, but also having to be very flexible. And secondly, I did my master's at Johns Hopkins SICE, which is an integrated course already, and then my PhD at the uh, University of Sussex in Great Britain and development studies, again focused on an interdisciplinary degree. I don't think that's very typical for people with advanced degrees, particularly in the United States, but there are fields like human ecology and the, the whole range of other fields that are interdisciplinary by nature, yeah. um, and those are becoming more and more popular and, and in demand, and, in fact, so that, it, in fact, the more narrow you are in your disciplinary, the less, I would argue, flexible you are in the marketplace to some extent. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, Salmon, we come, come to you now. Salmon Jafar is the program director at Social Impact and has worked in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors and has uh, about 12 years of experience in developing strategic human capital programs, including organizational assessments and evaluations, leadership development, strategic planning, change management, and other strategic initiatives. So, it sounds like a really good experience from an organizational um, um, perspective. So, Sam, what are your, your thoughts and, and reactions based on what we have been seeing? Um, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to file a complaint that Jace took all my talking points. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, just interesting to hear everyone's comments, and I'd like to echo all of that experience. I think um, integration is clearly a multifaceted concept, and it's funny to me that we didn't really define integration at the start of this panel. Um, but the reality is that when you talk to anyone um, and you ask them what integration is and you get like 50 million answers and that's the reality of the work. I mean, I think, you know, having also worked in uh, USAID uh, field office as well and now with social impact where we focus on monitoring evaluation, but we also look at, um, you know, we're also a management consulting arm as well. Um, thinking through not just the programmatic side of how do we achieve results and deliver on results, but really thinking through the environment like you were talking about, the management structure um, that's in place. Right now, one of our teams is working on a change management kind of intervention with the Tanzania USAID mission. Um, and really thinking through not just at the strategic level about how do you develop a CDCS and, and develop an objectives that are integrated and taking a more macro view, but how do you actually operationalize that in the organizational context? What type of structure, processes, culture, uh, personnel training? And this is a good example of a question where you ask what type of training is required? And I, I think people do have to come with a very multidisciplinary angle. Um, so I think that's definitely a, a it's, it's what I wrote down as kind of a, we have to be mirrors of integrations ourselves. We have to look at, at ourselves and rather than being in these siloed, uh, structures, we really have to seek ways in which to be more matrixed um, as an organization, more flat, or at least more, and if we can't break those, and in, understandably in certain circumstances we just can't, then figure out processes and, 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 and um, procedures in place that will allow us to, to make that work. Um, one thing I'd like to add, I guess maybe more from the measurement perspective, um, and having worked with, uh, before USAID, I was with the, the Center for Disease Control in Uganda, and there I actually worked on a PEPFAR program, so I got the wonderful uh, experience of PEPFAR. And one of the areas I worked in was the Orphan Vulnerable Children Programming, and that OVC program is actually a very much a microcosm of, of integration. I mean, when they're looking at, um, you know, nutrition, uh, education, social support, health, et cetera, you're basically talking about going to a household, delivering a set of interventions, albeit their limited set of interventions. Um, they do come from a multidisciplinary f um, perspective. And so that really, to me, is, is a good example, and it's very simple, of how we need to tackle 
um, integration um, and, and how do we implement that. Um, and let me talk a little bit more about s related work in the OVC sector. One of the things that we developed um, in Uganda, I remember, um, was a uh, was an index to measure vulnerability. And so I think really if you think about whatever you know uh, workplace you're in and, and whatever sector you're working in, ultimately your program is alleviating some sort of vulnerability, right? So if it's vulnerability of you know uh, poor education or if it's reduced health outcomes, you know maternal mortality or or a, tran a lack of transparent media, whatever it is. Um, so if you treat it from a vulnerability perspective, I think it's a beautiful framework along which you can really hang some of the integration factors because why we do integration is to alleviate ultimately some sort of vulnerability that exists. And at that moment, what you're thinking about is just whether it's at the community level, you know, individual level or the institutional level. And so I think if we kind of broaden our definition of what type of vulnerability we're trying to alleviate, um, that is a really a common thread that can also bring um, stakeholders together um, to, to this forum. And so there are really two ways from a measurement perspective that I see integration, which is this vulnerability, which is more of a deficit-based approach, which is, ah, you know, you're negative on this side, so we're going to come and deliver an intervention and then we're going to make it more positive. Uh, versus you're trying to, the other uh, side of the coin is basically looking at quality of life. And so in the literature and in a lot of the evaluation space, you will see now more uh, integration of uh, quality of life components and measurements uh, because those are the more higher level, impact level uh, measurements that people are looking at. Um, so I, I think uh, from a measurement perspective, those are kind of important frameworks. Um, the other thing to think about also is, uh, you know, integrated activities and interventions um, are typically trying to drive a single outcome or single impact level outcome. And typically we try to measure that or tease that in an evaluation. But the challenge is, can we actually um, measure that from a more performance monitoring perspective? You know, are there outcome indicators? Are there um, higher or lower level outcome indicators that can be put into place and routinized in a system that allow us uh, kind of to take a pulse of integration along the way in our programs. And so that I think really warrants some additional thinking and, and perspective um, and, and not really wait for you know these two, three years of you know, five years of cycles of uh, evaluation um, that we're seeing. Um, also, I think one of the things that I want to highlight also is, uh, you know, what Jace was talking about is uh, the beauty of uh, integrating qualitative work and the six case studies that you guys have done. I think that's, uh, you know, clearly adds value to integration because when we think of integration, we really think of the quantitative perspective. We're thinking of dollars. We're thinking of health or overall quality of life. And, uh, and that's fine, but the kind of the qualitative piece really does tend to add significant amount of value as to what are the underpinnings in that integrated ar approach and intervention, and how did it operate, and how did it, um, you know, improve our quality of life, for example. So I think there are, uh, there's a lot of value in um, looking at both qualitative and quantitative approaches. Um, the other kind of things I, I looked at was, or wrote down was, you know, just the type of indicators that we have in place, and I think they're beginning to evolve. Um, like, for example, you know, when you look at uh, nutrition-sensitive indicators uh, in the agricultural sector, that's uh, a very clear attempt to try to integrate both, you know, feed the future priorities, for example, uh, maternal child health priorities, um, global health priorities, et cetera. Um, also, I think we need to be uh, a little bit more intentional about funding measurement of integration. You know, just as we should be um, intentional about funding integration programs or integrated programs, um, I think we really need to think carefully. What I like to think of it as is, is planning for measurement, but really um, learning from management. Um, we need to really plan for the monitoring and the evaluations ahead of time. And as we implement that, as we manage that process, we need to learn from it and adapt to it. And that's obviously the heart of CLA and the various learning orientations that we have. So I think really we need to um, think through at what levels of integration do we want to measure our impact? Um, you know, what are some of the frameworks and deficit-based approaches that we want to look at? And what are some of the common themes uh, across the board that we want to try to uh, measure and, 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 and really successfully implement and measure integration? Thank you, Simon. So I'm going I'm to throw it back to you. What is your definition of integration? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I'm sorry, you I set know. yourself uh, up. Like. Well, I think, um, 
you know, I, I feel like there are more characteristics of uh, of integration in my mind. Um, I, I believe it's it's if integration is very intentional, um, and I like to think of it as you know, if it was not intentional, it'd be more like layered, right? So we would have these vertical programs, which a lot of us do, and they're not really talking to one another. They're very um, pretty much side by side or vertical, but there's an intentional move to align these two together. So that intention, you know, the intentionality is really important. Um, the other part to me that's important characteristic of integration is really kind of the community or the sustainability piece as well. Um, really that, you know, we're not talking about individuals, we're really talking about community level impact um, and, and that's often very multidimensional obviously, but we're also looking at sustainability as well and integration. Um, I think from the more of the management side, um, you know, like Jace was referring to, uh, we're looking about, we're talking about efficiencies and, and streamlining processes, but we're also looking at, um, I think, collaboration and learning as well. Uh, because we know that the reality is that a lot of us work in siloed environments, and so how do we bring all of that together? How, that, how, how do we bring all that knowledge together to drive integration? And so there's certainly a, a kind of a coordination collaboration role that's inherent. Great, thank you. It's, that's great. Um, so uh, Jim mentioned that there's a possibility of being over-integrated. Do you agree? Huh. I'd have to think about that. Um, <laughs> it is a good question. Um, I mean, uh, you know, I think so much of our time is really th uh, spent on thinking through how do we best integrate. Um, uh, you know, one of the areas where, um, I, and we were just talking about this earlier in, in Mozambique, for example, you know, we're looking at kind of, or, or at least what USAID was looking at, um, this Gorongosa buffer zone where there's a significant amount of bi biodiversity programming, it's a conservation activity, and then around that you have kind of these maternal, uh, you know, um, models, which is basically these clinics that provide MCH services and maternal child health services to communities around. Uh, one has to wonder, you know, um, y the intent is good, which is that, you know, we want to help uh, communities around that buffer area to to be li really take care of themselves. Um, but I think where it really could use some work and in, in, in its implementation is is w we have two different implementing partners doing that and 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 the challenge of coordinating that and and trying to fit kind of a square peg in a round hole. Um, that's you know. So I I think we just have to be and it maybe it's not an example of over integration, but I think what it uh, what it uh, raises is the level of complexity of not just the strategy and the project design and the activity design, but we also think about implementing partner competencies and the, the type of consortium that's really necessary in order to attack that integrated need in that community. So, Thank you. So Nanette, I, wa I wanted to come back um, uh, to you because I'm sitting next to you and I'm hearing a lot of uh, uh, agreement and reactions to what, what's being said. And I wonder whether you could talk a little bit about why are you excited to be part of the Locus Coalition and how Locus is positioning itself to work with actors such as we have here on the panel. What does that mean for, for you moving forward? And um, I, I think as we taught, we thought about today's event, we talked about integrated programmings holding the promise for delivering better development programming and as a result, nuanced, sustainable results for people in cycles of poverty. And I'm not quite sure that I understand what is meant by nuanced, sustainable results. So what's the nuance there that I might be missing? <laughs> can, you, can you share a little bit your thoughts and perspectives? Sure. Well, let me just say that uh, from a personal perspective, I'm very glad that PACT is a core member of LOCUS because I have then M&E uh, research colleagues that are part of the research working group along with me with whom I can share experiences and learn from them. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so the you know, this is a, a, a great opportunity for PACT and for other organizations that are part of LOCUS to come together, to share information, to learn from each other, um, and really drive forward. Uh, we were talking to Jace just before the panel started about, you know, the fact that organizations are already doing this is also then helping USAID to make the case for the fact that they need to fund these types of projects. So it's a, it's a good symbiotic relationship. Um, 
In terms of nuanced, sustainable results, I think that my colleague in the front row may have written <laughs> that particular <laughs> phrase, um, but uh, <laughs> she doesn't have a microphone in front of her. Not yet. <laughs> but, but, but my interpretation of it is that we have to, we have to, be, we have to pay attention to the context mm. in which we're doing the, the work. And we can't just take a integrated development program that works really well in Myanmar and say that it's also going to work well in Nepal or in South Africa. Um, but even within, uh, within Myanmar, there are so many different places. I don't want to talk just about Myanmar. And uh, we have another fantastic integrated project in Nigeria. But we wouldn't necessarily take it from that region and put right. it in another one. Right. Uh, so I think that, to me, is what, right. um, and and it gets back to, Jace used the right word, uh, local solutions, is, is what I was trying to get at when I was talking about village development committees, having people on the ground deciding what it is that they're going to prioritize. Because I think prioritization is important not only for our research agenda, but it's, it's also important for these projects, because people can't do everything at once. You can't, you can't tear your kitchen, living room, dining room and bathroom apart all at the same time and continue living in your house, right? So, but <coughs> same goes with, with, uh, with development. And I'm glad that you were a Peace Corps volunteer, so was I. And <laughs> you do get a perspective when you're on the ground and you see uh, what's happening and, and, and you do have this overload issue. And I just wanna answer really quickly the question you ask of, <coughs> of Salman. Uh, are there dangers of too much integration? Yes, and we just had a series of workshops where uh, in the field where PACT got uh, people together to talk about our integrated approach. And one of the things we discussed was what happens when you overload community volunteers? Mm -hmm. And you're asking the same community volunteer to visit a household to talk about health and nutrition and food security, but also about livelihoods and savings and loans and uh, not to mention gender and equality and, and all sorts of other things. And so what hap you can't take people that are volunteers and ask them to do too much. So yeah. I think that's the other. Sounds like Jace's colleagues too. It's sort of that that reporting on, on so many indicators, sort of an well, overload. Right, yeah. that's that's the M&E perspective, yeah. yes. And so, if, if I may, Please. can I just talk about integration at different levels? So I've just mentioned some one of the downfalls at the community level, but of course the community is one of the four questions that we wanna ask is the community perspective of uh, on integrated programming but then even across um, projects uh, uh, or within projects but also across projects as as Jim was getting at wh what happens when when similar projects or projects that are working in the same areas aren't talking to each mm. other so collaboration communication and this is really one place where PAC tries to play a convening role and bring different projects and different organizations together so we do it with our partners on projects but then we also do it with others um, and a uh, project we just started in Zambia, we were in fact asked to um, bring together all the DREAMS recipients mm. in Zambia. Um, but then back to Ma Myanmar quickly, at the, at the country office level, we just restructured our country office in Myanmar so it could be more integrated. And then, and then you mm. get to headquarters and so there's very many different levels that you have to pay attention right. to in terms of coordination and collaboration. Great, thank you. Simon, I wanted, wanted to ask you uh, about one of the questions that Nanette had, had thrown out um, originally in looking at the locus top four questions. The number one um, question that, that well, the first question, not necessarily the number one, but the first question that was identified is when might integration not be appropriate? Is integration always appropriate? What, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Interesting question. Yeah. Um, I think th this kind of brings back to my mind um, Jace's kind of point on local solutions. And we have to be respectful, I think, of the context in which um, our programs are taking place. And so if we have, we obviously work with, you know, various levels of facilities or, or USAID, for example, and DFID, work min ministries and governments. And I think we have to be collaborative and be able to work within that structure as well and try to work in a way where there's alignment. Um, and I, I think that while, and this kind of brings about an, in, an interesting kind of tension, which is that while many of us in, in the missions or in the programs and the field offices may be thinking about integration, 
how much of that is actually true in the the communities in which we operate, in the countries in which we operate, the ministries uh, with whom we deal? Um, and so I think there we have to really um, be careful about you know overstepping that and trying to align ourselves uh, in our approaches um, that reflect integration and bring people along with the ride as well. Um, and so so I, I think there there are things to be um, explored there um, for sure and, and and just kind of those inherent tensions between our priorities versus the con host country priorities as well. Great, thank you. So Jason, Jim, I, I want to ask you the same question and get your perspectives. Um, so one of the, the colleagues um, with whom I've worked with over the years so when we talk about integration, she has said to me, you know Roger Mark, um, we very often hear people say that we need to simplify development. And she's, enough with the simplifiers. We need to complexify. We need more complexifiers. Um, what do you think? Do you agree? Um, less simplifiers, more complexifiers? I, I, no, I'm not going <laughs> to. No, I'm not going to. I can't sit up here and say that it needs to be more complex, especially from a donor perspective. That's why I asked you. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> It's complex enough as it is. Um, I think a lot of, you know, at least from, you know, you can think about it from the Washington point of view. I think we need to simplify it. I think, I think. Wh we why do we need to simplify it? Because we, uh, in a lot of instances, we're getting in our own way. We, in order to take one step forward, we first need to scale a wall. And that's too much effort and it's too much of a drain on resources in order to move in the direction that the data is telling us we need to go. Um, so I'm not, uh, you know, I, I can't say that we need to complexify, but I think we, we can allow for complexity. I, I don't think we need to reduce everything down to, you know, some simple, easy principles and acronyms. We need to allow for complexity. We need to be able to embrace it, but we need a learning agenda and we need knowledge management systems that allow this complexity to be overcome with the information that people need. Great. Thank you. Jim, your thoughts? On the question of uh, integration, too much, too little, um, I think it, it depends on, on what, what we're talking about in terms of what's getting integrated. So in the area of environment, let's say, where I work, um, it's literally impossible not to address, not to avoid addressing the issue of institutional governance or rule of law when it comes to environment because that's what governs the sector, uh, that is environment. Uh, similarly with climate change. Um, and I would say that's also true for economic growth. There's very little about natural resources and ecosystems that support the use of those resources uh, that doesn't have an economic component, either a direct alternative livelihoods, I mean, or direct, direct livelihoods component, or an indirect one in terms of provision of ecosystem goods and services mm -hmm. that support other uh, sectors directly. I mentioned pollination. That's just one example. Water supply is even more common e example. So in, in those, for those two sectors, which are, uh, I would call them sort of diffuse integration, their tools, their systems, uh, law, legal, regulatory frameworks, PETA, uh, in the environment field, PETA dominates. You know, participation, inclusion, transparency, and accountability have always been very important for environmental management. Mm -hmm. um, and environmental compliance as well. Um, so where I think the intentional uh, area comes in is when you're going across sort of the technical sectors, um, you know, health and food security, let's say, or uh, biodiversity and uh, education or, you know, whatever combination. Those do have to be addressed more carefully. And I think there you have an interesting uh, potential for mixing different tools. So a contract that has very strict controls in from the standpoint of AIDS management might be good for some sorts of uh, uh, integration, whereas a, a, an assistance, a, a grant or a cooperative agreement might be better for mm -hmm. other aspects. So, mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Let's open it up.
We'd like to hear your questions. My colleagues will uh, come to you with a microphone. I'll ask you to identify yourself and get to your question quickly so we can take a number of questions. So um, if you raise your hand, we'll start with, with uh, you at the front. And your name, your affiliation, and uh, to your question Hi. quickly. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi, my name is Suhail Salaudin, and I, my background is in structured finance, business, and development. And I think I've been doing integrated work for about 25 years. So just to give a matrix sort of response question quickly, as Roger said, uh, to if we're still debating this, I would just say from the start where Nenet started with the idea of the pilot project, I mean, you need to have controls in the experiment to start with before they are designed to know what a differentiated outcome is. There is, and like Jim said, I mean, everything in an environment is related. I feel like all the projects I do, even in finance, we draw on every aspect, whether writing an annual report now, it's required in corporate law, by the way, just so you guys know, because I don't think there's anybody here from business. You are required, aside from finance, to cover environment, health, safety, governance. If you exclude it, you will be delisted from the stock exchange. So there is a requirement to have an integrated approach and it's the basis of all Ivy League educational designs. So if you separate them out, what will happen, if I could challenge the technical framework being put forward here is, you will end up with completely incorrect results. To divvy up risk by sector and add it up one by one additively is not accurate according to all the research. It does not work, you have to incorporate correlations. The whole country would fall apart if we actually stopped integrating disciplines right now. In one hour, it would fall apart. <laughs> I, I mean, so my question is, in a way, what I'm thinking is, you know, this is not an intellectual or research-based issue anymore. Maybe it's a cultural issue. So in terms of training and finance and the amount of resources we will put into training all the people now, it's too long and too much. It's not cost-effective because maybe there is a way people learn also. So just to give an example, you know, in the 80s, you know, Michael Lewis wrote a book about why football players were being hired in investment banks to do finance. There was no correlation between muscle and intellect there. <laughs> you know, and it worked, right? So they changed all the people in the financial industry in New York, and suddenly you found like little small guys, you know, writing books and doing structured finance. So I'm saying maybe, you know, it's something that is more fundamental that Salman was touching on that we ourselves need to reflect an integrated approach before we can show somebody else. And it's not so much about data and putting it together because it will come out as articulate prose as we saw, right? But it doesn't sort of hang together. So maybe it's about not doing all this but finding a different type of culture and a different paradigm and for that we have to adjust internally first. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yes. Please. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Trey Taylor with uh, Burdent Power, a marine renewable energy company. I have a rhetorical question for the panel, which is who integrates the integrators? <laughs> All right, thank you. Yes, lady behind you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ellen Chigwanda. I'm from Harare, Zimbabwe. I'm an Echidna Global Scholar with the Brookings Institution. Um, and my question is, what is the point of departure for integration? Is it starting with, um, you know, just looking at Jace? Is it starting with the different pillars within the donor? Is it looking at our program priorities as PACT? Is it looking at me as the villager in the, in the community and what, what I need or what I require? What is the point of departure for integration? Great, thank you, yes. Uh, I think we have a question up front. Thank you. Yes, I just have a very short comment based on <laughs> being tipped by Nanette, and now I have a microphone. So I know these folks. Um, for everyone else, my name's Trisha Petruni. I'm a technical advisor for integrated development at FHI 360. So Roger Mark, I just wanted to give a very um, brief response to your question about you know, the um, nuanced results people are looking for and therefore measuring from integration. So um, as part of the research working group and LOCUS that came up with the research agenda, I think one of our main priorities was to unpack that a little bit to say, you know, again, as an integration advisor, people often say, well, Tricia, you know, what does the evidence say? Does integration work? And we're pushing back on that question to say, 
there's no universal definition of what works means. You have to unpack that and say work can mean a lot of different things based on what was your original um, rationale for pursuing integration. As Jay said, it's not the goal. It's an end. It's a potential end to a goal. So you have to match what you're measuring in terms of results to the reason you thought integration would add value in the first place. So a couple of the examples we have in the research agenda on the different nuances of results that we want to see and that we should be measuring for using a variety of research methods are things like user satisfaction. So do people actually prefer an integrated model of, of development? Another one, for example, is reach. So are you reaching a higher total number of people if you use a multi-sector approach? And maybe that's important to you. Um, some folks might pursue it to reduce inequality. Mm -hmm. So maybe you combined sectors and you ended up reaching the same number of people, which doesn't sound that impressive, but it will be if those people include your most vulnerable, most remo remote target population. So that's another potential benefit of integration. A lot of foundations and donors are going to be interested in, of course, cost. Do we get cost savings or cost efficiencies, value for money by doing this? So I think, Roger Mark, in the research agenda, We've presented folks with this range of potential benefits of integration and are asking that folks measure those different dimensions based on what the original objective of pursuing integration was and look at that as the potential results. And again, moving away from this universal, does integration work? Mm -hmm. You have to follow that up with what you mean by work. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, we have a couple more questions here. Uh, Kristen Lindell, um, M&E specialist with the Bureau for Policy Planning and Learning through the LEARN contract. Um, so one of the panelists mentioned that the learning and collaborating that needs to be done for integration to work well, um, maybe for these larger contractors that doesn't need to be funded by the donor organization. But I wanted to push back a little bit and get some thoughts about, you know, from the donor perspective and also the implementing partner perspective, what are the enabling conditions necessary to allow these partners on the ground to do the collaborating, learning, and adapting necessary um, to do integrated development well? You know, does that mean a shift in the language in the contracts or the parameters in the mechanisms that people need to work through? Great, thank you. So we have a few questions. Let's take these and then we'll come back. I know there are a few more hands. We also have a question um, that I think, Tricia, you have partially uh, responded to, but this is a question online that's coming from at USAID Learning. And the question is, do you think we need more evidence that integrated development works, or should we just do it because it's common sense? <laughs> okay, so we have five, five questions. Um, is integration a, a cultural issue? Who integrates the integrators? What's the point of departure? Where are you starting from? What are the enabling conditions for learning and collaboration? And uh, is there more evidence? Do we need more evidence that integrated development works? Or is it just a common sense uh, issue? Uh, who would like to start? One or all of the above? Jim. I'd like to take the point of departure question. Um, one of the uh, tools that's used in the environment field is the, from the Open Standards for Conservation uh, movement is the use of situation analysis and theories of change. Um, and the advantage of the situation analysis is that you lay out the problem in its entire dimensions, both from the standpoint of uh, if your threat a particular threat that you want to overcome or opportunity that you want to seize, because it depends on w what, what particular issue you're addressing, and trace back the drivers and the original uh, uh, drivers and, and causes of those drivers, uh, then you line up a range of solutions or at least pathways to reaching your reduced threats or increased opportunities. And that, that provides a, a very useful analytical point of departure that can then drive one or more designs for a particular intervention. Um, so I think the, and then that results, of course, in a theory of change that if X is met and Y is met, then Z will be uh, uh, you know, achieved. Okay, great, thank you. Can I just right. build on that and say uh, the, the APEA that Jace was talking about is another, it's, it's in the, uh, similar to the situation analysis, the political economy analysis. 
Um, I'll say that Locus is the integrator of the integrators. <laughs> um, that's the purpose behind the coalition, is to bring together people who are doing integrated development. Well, I'll take the collaboration question. Um, I, I think some of the enabling conditions really are, I mean, if you're looking at the relationship, between, I think donors and implementing partners, more than I think procurement language, I think there needs to be kind of a, a manage a motivated management on the donor side that really holds um, the variety of partners accountable. And I think I alluded to earlier that, you know, do we want to go with the model where we have um, partners that offer very specialized services and sectoral services, or do we want to look more broadly at kind of jacks of all trades, which is more integrated service delivery platforms as well. Um, the other, I think, thing to consider is is, is a well-informed needs assessment, I think, in communities, because particularly because integration is so multifaceted, um, it really needs a well-informed, well-implemented needs assessment for the communities in which you're going to operate, and that's going to be the basis for which but a basis against which you will implement and then measure your results. Um, and I think there has to be kind of a willingness to be to have a contingency approach, right? So um, trying to be adaptive, but at the same time and iterative in the in the monitoring and an evaluation of your data as well, um, and just being flexible in terms of the types of needs you have, the types of interventions that are necessary, even at the w even if it's not just community, but within community within households as well, and be able to adjust your um, service delivery, really. I'm going to try to answer all these questions. All right. <laughs> so from the, from the culture perspective, the internal change, I think you're absolutely right. S from the donor perspective, if we're asking our partners to integrate, whether it's to integrate programs that one donor, that one implementer has under their umbrella, or to ask two different organizations to work together, I think we need absolutely to set an example first, um, showing them that what we do back at our mission is integrated and we're working together and it's running smoothly. I think that sets the example. That, that, that leads me to your question about the enabling conditions on the ground. From the mission perspective, the 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 most important enabling condition is leadership if leadership is on board and if leadership sees integrated programming as a priority it will happen and so i think if we have leadership on board if they understand what integrated development can do what an integrated set of approaches can do i think that will unlock all these doors about collaboration and learning mm -hmm. and we at the mission can start to organize ourselves and in doing that i think we then set an, the internal example to our partners about about how to carry forth the management of this when you ask about points of departure at least from what we have learned in the field, each mission, each USAID mission, sort of has their own origin story about why they started with integrated development. Malawi has their entire uh, country development strategy integrated. The whole thing is integrated. And there was a certain set of circumstances that led them down that road. In Nepal, uh, I visited Nepal with my colleague, Dr. Ahern, and you know, we've been, the U.S. government has been giving development assistance to Nepal for longer than USAID has been in existence. <laughs> and while we've made some great gains with that investment, Nepal still needs a lot of help. So the people at the mission there looked up and said, geez, we've been here for 60 years. Where are the results? And so that's what led them to, to start uh, down the integrated path. And I guess the last one was, what does work mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what does work mean? I think that's a great point because, as you mentioned earlier, I don't think integrated approaches in the long run will cost more. I hypothesize that they will cost less, maybe after initially costing more. But what you said earlier, what, uh, what is the opportunity cost? What is the cost of not working integratedly. Should we do it because it's common sense or should we do it because it actually, uh, we, ha we have the evidence? Uh, I'd say, yeah, both. It is common sense, 
but we do need the evidence in order to justify that. So what does work mean? Maybe a program that's more sustainable and whose results don't need to be topped up year after year after year by other programming. I think that is what works means. <coughs> so Jason, um, great, fantastic. I, I, I wanted to build on some of your earlier uh, comments on the political economy framework mm -hmm. and the question that we have on, on culture and your earlier statement on power dynamics. Right. You know, I think at the heart of this is getting to how we deal with power dynamics that are not necessarily political in nature. A, a lot of it might be cultural. Mm -hmm. How do we, so we talk about an individual, a culture change on an individual level. But if you look at the culture and, and, and within a country, or within a specific setting, and you get to the questions around power dynamics, right. How, how do we manage that? How do we deal with that? That is is really difficult. That that is very difficult. I think the uh, but I think the tools are already in place, not just in the minds of the USAID officers working in the field, but also in terms of the resources that other organizations have produced in the political econ in our political economy framework, which was not just invented out of whole cloth. We really did take a hard look at all the other organizations, the Dutch, the Brits. I mean, a lot of people have been working very hard on this for a long time. So a lot of these ideas are already out there. Now, when we think about how to understand power dynamics in a country, there's, a, there's lots of tools that are, are already well established that we can draw from. Systems thinking is a, a way to help us organize not just institutions and actors, but the relationships between them. I think that can start to help us tease out these power dynamics. You know. An another another way to do this is, is that the PEA is not an event. Yes, there is an initial assessment where we go out into the field and an analysis that comes out of that, but it's not an event. It's not a one-time thing. It's something that when missions learn to think and work politically, it is happening constantly. And our understanding of the context and of those power dynamics are constantly refreshed because we're staying in touch with our contacts in the field and we're learning more about the changing context all the time. Can I jump in? Because uh, we also do a lot of applied political economy at PACT and um, I see a connection between that and ethnography and I'm trained as an anthropologist so getting back to the earlier question about what do we train people in and anthropologists are by nature holistic. We look at whole cultures. Um, and we also know quite a bit about culture change. So um, that's another great field to go into. Um, but the, 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 the important thing is what Jace just said, is keeping your finger on the pulse and knowing what's happening in the communities. And so by working with local organizations and local solutions and by reading the local systems paper that USAID mm -hmm. came out with a few years ago, that's really for me the point of departure is to understand those systems and to understand how they're changing. Cultures change in lots of different ways, and knowing which way they're going is, is important. Great. Thank you. Um, I would just say, as a father, I'm glad to hear you give that plug for anthropology, because my son <laughs> is majoring in anthropology and sociology. So <laughs> that's, that's a good, good, I'll pass that message on. Good. Let's take a few more questions. We'll come um, here to the front, and then we'll work our way around. This way. So once again, your name and uh, your affiliation, and if you could get quickly to your question. Thank you. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, in getting the integration, uh, to what extent are you able to get agreement among the participants on the objectives of the program, and can you use the Internet to get more transparency and get the people together on this? Thank you. Yes, please. Just behind you. Mason. Yes, Mason Ingram from PACT. And I have a question on time horizons. Mm -hmm. um, Jim mentioned this a little bit that, you know, some people make the case that integrated programming takes longer and, and your response was, well, compared to what? And I do think that's a key question. But one thing that does occur to me in some of the highly integrated programs <coughs> that I've observed is that in the first, in the early years of a project, a certain number of blind, uh, some blinders are required to set up, say, a livelihoods project component and a governance component and a health component. 
And it's in the out years that you get a lot of real cross-fertilization across these lines. One of the interesting things about the Myanmar program that Nanette mentioned is that we're actually headed into a 18-month extension of the program, which really allows us to take advantage of a lot of the integration that has happened early on in the project. So I'm interested, Jim, in your experience and in, in, in many of the programs you've worked on, and also Jace, as to from your learnings, what have you seen in terms of the time horizons? How does that affect USAID's thinking in terms of what is required for um, really being able to take advantage of highly integrated programs? And not only integration within one implementer's program, but across implementers. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yes, I think we had a few more hands at, at the back. Yeah, yes? Ken Conk at American University and currently a fellow here at the center. Uh, great panel, thanks. Uh, appreciate the discussion. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, participatory, responsive, client-driven development, right, which has got to be the central aim. And there's been occasional allusions to, you know, needs assessment and keeping your finger on the pulse and so on. But as you've been talking, I've been sitting here and thinking about how does that challenge, which is always there in development program, how does it change? as you move to a more integrated approach? In what ways does it get easier? In what ways get harder? In what ways does it just uh, just get different? Because I'm, I'm kind of seeing things on both sides of the ledger in, in my own mind. So for example, Lynette's point about exhausting your volunteers, that's a change. That's something that's new that you wouldn't have necessarily with the more siloed kinds of approaches. And so just in your experience, what would be the top two or three kinds of new challenges that emerge um, whatever the advantages are, I'm particularly interested in what are the new challenges and the, and the new things that people might not anticipate they really have to watch for to make sure that it stays client-driven and responsive and participatory. Thank you. Yes, I think we had a few more hands. Yes, at the back. Hi, thank you for this panel. My name is Dilla Fruz Honikboyeva. I'm a director at the Aga Khan Foundation. We are actually Part of Locus, we're incredibly happy about that. And um, for those of you who don't know, the Aga Khan Foundation, uh, multi-area input, multi-input area development is one of our things, which means integrated development for us. Um, and I'm actually incredibly thrilled to hear kind of um, the tides moving in that direction, and all of you being kind of committed to that. One story I wanted to share: we have a study coming out next month around 10 years in Badakhshan, which is a northern pro province of Afghanistan, about the quality of life and what integrated development looks like. So I wanted to share this one study, especially when we're talking about behavior change and culture change, is that there's an apple farmer and he's gotten into the habit of stocking them in the winter time. So obviously it's the livelihoods and it's the income generation, but he uses that money that he generates to send his daughter to the university. And so that's just one story of what we hope to publish next month is what does it look like to kind of integrate all these sectors but look beyond that in terms mm -hmm. of change. So again, thank you for that, and we're incredibly thrilled to be a part of this. Thank you, and, and once the study's out, how, how can we get access to it? Um, so actually, we wanted I'm, to I'm sorry, j yeah, just because we were recording. Right, we'll actually kind of share that on our website through Locust as well. We're hoping to have an event as well, not necessarily in September because it'll be after UNGA. We don't think it'll be a great time necessarily in DC, but further into the winter. So if you're interested, definitely come and talk to me and my colleagues. We're, we're thrilled that you're excited. Great, thank you. I think we had, yes, yes. Hi, thanks, Laura Ahern, um, Learning Division USAID. Um, I had a question about change management. And um, I know Salman mentioned it in his book. I'm, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Is this working? Yes, I, I think you just need to speak. Hi, there can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Um, Laura Ahern, USA Learning Division, DRG Center. Um, I had a question about change management, and Salman had mentioned it before. Um, and I wanted to know whether the same sorts of approaches to um, what we were just discussing um, staying close to people you're working with, um, you know, all of that uh, sort of needs assessment, those sorts of human-centered design, anthropological, ethnographic approaches can also be used in um, an organizational setting, such as USAID or an implementer's office, and uh, it also relates to the question about culture that, that uh, came up just a little while ago, if we have a, uh, a need to change culture or adapt it in certain ways, so at least to change behavior, how do we go about it? 
Thank you. All right, and I, I guess I, I wanted to, to um, also just build on the story of the apple farmer and, and livelihoods and income generation. Um, I know from some of my experience with integrated programming, when we talk about sustainability, and it's a, a factor that many of you have mentioned, um, we had identified in some of the specific population health and environment integration programming that when there was a livelihoods dimension mention to the programming that led to greater sustainability mm -hmm. of the programs and I wonder we could whether we could just have a few comments or your thoughts on what you mean by sustainability when you talk about sustainability so uh, a few questions for you how do you get agreement ar around uh, among the partners at the inception um, is the internet and other online tools useful for integration and bringing people together uh, what about different time horizons how do you manage that what are the implications across different um, implementers looking at integration how do you deal with change in the context of a participatory responsive client driven development approach and then an associated question what does that mean for change management in an organizational setting and then uh, what about sustainability what are your thoughts on sustainability so Nanette, can we start with you uh. One or <laughs> anywhere you'd like to start. I think I'm going to pass to Salman for a minute. Yeah. Okay, well, Salman, let's go. Okay, well, I'll take the change management question. Um, it's been, you know, really fascinating to work with a, a mission and and within a mission as well, where we've really tried to push uh, integration. I have a colleague here who I've worked with before on that. Um, and I, I, I echo the, some of the same points you've said before, which I think is there's a, a great deal of, there's a need for leadership motivation and drive and accountability to make any sort of substantial change happen in a mission setting. Um, and I think in Tanzania, you really do see some of that where, um, you know, we basically did these management um, assessments and then we did these multiple sets of retreats, for example, based on surveys. And really, you, we went from a very kind of isolated structure Kind of very vertical programming to um, highlighting and really uh, i would say the you know using more appreciative inquiry in terms of like trying to understand what's actually going well in the missions programs um, and trying to understand that you know there are like three sets of programs that they're really proud of where there's a heavy amount of integration going on and how do we learn from the principles within that share that knowledge across the mission structures um, and then bring that together and what ended up happening was really they formed kind of a core management group for the CDCS, um, which really was multi-sectoral and didn't really exist. And it was something that was more than just a DO level, development objective level um, structure that existed in place. And so that brought an incredible amount of, I think, vision, accountability, motivation to the entire process, and that it still exists. And so you know, now we're at a point where this, uh, because the structural element exists, what we're trying to figure out is, Anytime a, a new employee comes to the mission, how do we make them basically a change agent um, inside of the mission? Um, and how do we basically convert people who are already there into strong advocates of integration and understand why it matters in the mission setting? Um, so I, I, I think that there are very different approaches in different missions, but I, I do believe leadership, I think proper structures can be leveraged. I think like Jace also said earlier, a lot of integration is already happening. And so you really want to tap into what's going on in the mission, trying to figure out what you're proud of and, and how does that, how can that be scaled up internally? Right. So to that point, you know, we're working on something right now. We have a lot of partners in partner missions in Africa that are doing some really interesting integrated programming. And what we're, what we hope to do soon is bring them all together in one location and really workshop through what's working with them and what problems they're see what problems they're seeing not just to document that and to mark the trends although we think that's important as well but also to just right then and there workshop the problems you know if someone's saying well i'm having trouble with our contracting office uh, they're not cooperating um, well, and then another mission right there can say, well, oh, listen, we had a great partner and this is what we learned. Um, you try this, try that. Maybe this, maybe this solution will work. So we're, we're trying to build that community practice and make it really deep and really strong. And we hope 
through that, we can start to convert some of the skeptics that are at the mission and make it a cultural thing. So when mm -hmm. new officers go to that mission, whether they're new to the agency or just new to that mission, they'll see that integration is something that people are talking about and that they want. this is something is seen as a cultural value. Um, we think that's really important. Um, to your question about time horizons and how certain components of programs can start less quickly than others and 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 gain purchase uh, less quickly w one thing that we found that's really really important is that the most robust integrated programs are those that are intentional from design to implementation this is not something that you you mentioned earlier you said integration is intentional it is intentional now you can you know suddenly realize a synergy between two ongoing programs and maybe you want to draw them closer together and, and that's great but in order to be truly robust it needs to start at the beginning and I think if there's an understanding that yeah maybe the health component of this new integrated program is going to kick off and it's just going to it's just going to catch fire no problem but the other parts are going to take a little bit longer as long as there's an understanding to that i don't think that's a problem at all i think that's i think that's great i think we need to if that is a problem i think we need to learn a lesson in patience <laughs> i just want to build on on that last point uh i think in when you're talking about design and putting starting a activities separately they have to be designed so that they have linkages that will work later on. Mm -hmm. So you have yeah. to build them in so that they're not just going to keep traveling like this unless you push them in. They will naturally go this way, mm -hmm. but they have to be designed that way. The other w point I wanted to cover was the uh, Internet. I think I'd broaden that to the whole field of information and communications technology. Uh, this has been a force multiplier, as the military likes to say, when it comes to enabling integrated development because – uh, if you just look at geographical information systems, those are by uh, design an integrated platform uh, for spatial data analysis using many different data layers that provide a way of seeing holistically what's going on in any, any given location. This is, has been invaluable um, in terms of, of, of enabling uh, actual building on and achieving synergies as well as avoiding things like cumulative impacts or uh, future uh, disasters in, 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 uh, in the design of infrastructure, for example, and so forth. The other thing about ICT is that the Internet mobile technology has enabled knowledge sharing to really, really come down in terms of the, the obstacles to it. And e even to, I mean, when I was working in Cairo not so long ago, you'd see shepherds walking down the street with phones. I mean, these are guys are really poor, but they had enough money for a phone. And they were using it. I mean, they were using it to set up meetings to sell their sheep, if nothing else. And so the, that's just a, a simple example, but the ICT revolution has, is a big factor, I think, in, in uh, making integrated development work better. Just one mo no, a moment on the sustainability question. I think from the standpoint of the, the farmer example there, it's, it, there was a behavior change that was facilitated by having a very strong set of incentives that becomes internalized. And it's, it, that's the sustainability issue has to be a question of internalization of incentives for, for positive change. And that's going to di differ amongst the sectors and w even within sectors. So thank you for your question about uh, getting everyone to agree on the objectives from the beginning because it actually relates to the question in the back about one of the challenges. And this is when we're bringing together partners who do health and wash and uh, livelihoods and uh, agriculture, et cetera, getting everyone together and making them see that they're all working towards common goals and t common objectives is not always so easy. And this is where it does take a little more time sometimes. Uh, but the idea that everyone's going to work together and breaking down some of those barriers in terms of people naturally wanting to advocate for their sector being first in terms of the timeline, right? And so trying to figure out how is it that these are all going to work together and wh what are our common objectives is crucial. And that's one of the challenges. But it also gets back to, I think we were talking about earlier, uh, we were talking in fact about um, government agencies. And uh, one of the levels I, f I neglected to mention a few minutes ago was working with various ministries. Mm -hmm. 
and getting ministries to work together um, mm. is another is another issue that we we sometimes face. Um, in terms of the Aga Khan study, I wanted to say thanks to you and also to um, I think it was Jace or Jim who said earlier about quality of life. Uh, this is another thing that we're looking at, at very seriously at PACT, and it's one of the other questions that the Myanmar project is looking at in terms of measuring that as an outcome, uh, in terms of quality of life. And um, in terms of sustainability, for PACT, a lot of it is about building local infrastructure, local governance structures, PETA, I like PETA, um, but making sure that we, when we leave behind, there are people who are talking together and working together and um, they don't need us anymore to convene. Great, thank you. So, so as we wrap up, I'm just gonna ask you one final question that I'll ask you each to take no more than 30 seconds to respond. But you, you step out of this auditorium, you go to the elevator and you are riding to the first floor and someone says, what did you just say on that panel? <laughs> what do you say? What's your key takeaway message? 30 seconds or less. What do you want people to remember the most from your conversation uh, today? Who would like to tackle that? I'll go, I'll go first. Um, 30 seconds starting now. So DRG is not just something that is important to integrate. We really think it's the key ingredient to help other sectors integrate. We believe that DRG, the PETA principles, are catalytic, something that can be the glue that allows, say, health and education to, to, um, to link together. We also think that, and I say we, I'm speaking on behalf of my team in the DRG Center, that we really believe that governance considerations are the key to unlocking sustainability, and sustainability in this case being the, the, the ability that these gains that we make in our investments stay after we leave. And we think that's really, really important. And by, by being sensitive to that political context and by being able to manage adaptively, by being able to iterate as we go, we really think that we can achieve greater impact and greater sustainability across all of the sectors. Thank you. Who's next? Jim. I'll go next. 30 seconds starting now. <laughs> uh, so in an era of climate change and the tremendous vulnerabilities of our planet towards, uh, from climate change, um, from the ever increasing, it seems, number of fragile states in conflict, um, the, the world can't afford to have single sector projects, activities um, that do not achieve synergy and do not achieve multiple ob objectives because we don't have the time for that anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think to go back to what my other colleague said in the last 10, 15 seconds, the key to that is, is transparency and governance. Mm -hmm. And that in integration can help facilitate both of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, not to the exclusion of single sector, but to achieve that synergy and good governance is essential today. Great, thank you. So I would say that integrated development is happening and we need to do a better job and be more intentional about gathering the data that we already have and gathering new data that's going to help to prove that uh, there are, that where, where integrated approach is, is, is warranted, where it's not, and, and where it's working. And that includes defining work. Um, so where we're having greater impact, but also by looking at process and structure and other things that are not just about impact. Great, thank you. Um, I'll share maybe more two, or two, I think, philosophical things to leave with. Um, I think what I gleaned from the conversation really were, were two things, and I think the Aga Khan example is a really good one, which talks about kind of development as a multi-generation um, program, project, process, whatever you want to call it, it's process. Um, and I, I think that, that we have to be just mindful that no five-year, 10-year plan is ever going to articulate and really measure the true impact of 
of any intervention. Um, and, and I think that Apple Pharma example is a key takeaway because what a beautiful analogy where you can really see someone make a decision with their income to actually fund future um, education op opportunities for their for their children. Um, that's a great example. And the other thing is I really believe that development itself is in itself in infancy. Um, I think it's growing, it's developing. I, I think when you look at any sort of system where it starts and it starts very specialized and then over time it becomes a bit more diverse and I think that's where we are today. We are at undoing some of the silos, the linear thinking, the kind of, you know, it's just my program and me thinking to it's us. It's about a, a more complex world and we need more complex solutions. So I think from we're becoming slowly more diverse in our thinking and, and, and more divergent. Wow. Talk about food for thought. There's a, lo a lot here. Um, so I think we've had a really rich, rich discussion. And I, I think um, I, I, I reflect back to just the, the context of how we talked about, about integration from statements like, I don't think integration is important. It's essential. It's really at the core of development. Silos will exist. We need to think of semi-permeable uh, membranes. Mm -hmm. Think about how we permeate <laughs> them and what that means. How do we operate within that context? But at the same time to recognize that the fields are inherently connected, they're integrated, and households are integrately, uh, inherently connected and integrated. We also talked about, we didn't say the word, but I, it, I heard resilience. Mm -hmm. The importance of adapting to risks and needing to plan for that and do that. And we talked, as, as I, I think as part of setting the, the context, the costs and the opportunity costs. What are the alternatives to not, um, not integrating? What does that mean? We also talked a little about the characteristics of integration. We talked about the intentionality, the sustainability, the efficiencies and opportunities to collaborate and learn. And then importantly, I think we talked about integration not as an end, but as a means to a better impact. So that for me was a, a little bit of the context setting for, for our discussion today. I think from there we talked about challenges. How do we move forward what, with integration? How do we deal with the earmarks, the indicators, the reporting, and the perceived restrictions on what can and cannot be done? How do we go to where the other sectors are mentally? How do we do that? How do we deal with the different flavors of money that came up? You know, if it's not all green, how do we manage that? What's, what's the challenge and the fear of being over-integrated? Does that lead to an impossible design? What are the implications for that? We recognize the importance of looking also at power dynamics. And if you have to deal with administrative structures, how do you work across ministries? That may be an impediment. What do you do when you don't have leadership buy-in? We recognize that as being really critical. And then the time frame for looking at, at impact. You know, if we move beyond the project cycle time frame. So these are all challenges that we talked about. We also talked a lot about opportunities and tools that are available from the applied political economy framework to the opportunities that an SDG framing is offering us now, to how we define success and what that means, to having both qualitative and quantitative indicators. We talked about the opportunity of institutional arrangements, of learning, iterative learning as we go, how organizations can be more matrixed ourselves, how do we take advantage of that, and integration as a means to reduce vulnerability and address quality of life issues. So there were many, many opportunities um, and tools that we talked about and identified. And once again, it, it led us to some of the questions that we looked at from the very beginning. You know, we talked about when is integration appropriate? What is the cost? What does it mean for engagement with local communities? What does it mean for sustainable integrated results? 
also what does it mean for management architecture what is needed and how do we learn and plan from management how do we operationalize integration in a management space? And how does it lead to higher level outcome indicators that help us to take a pulse of the systems in which we are, or we are working? And what does it mean for change management as a development approach, but also as an organizational cultural approach? So we covered quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and it, 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 it makes me think back to some of the integrated programs that I've worked with in the Philippines. And I remember working with a partner in the Philippines um, in a very difficult context. And he said to me, you know, Roger Mark, this question on integration makes sense. It makes sense, S-E-N-S-C, -E, because it's logical. We don't live our life in silos. This resonates with us. There are opportunities and economies of scale. It makes sense. He said it also makes sense, S-E-N-T. It sounds good. It resonates with partners. It resonates with the local communities. They want to be engaged. It, it should be resonating with donors and, and, and others. And he said to me, finally, it makes sense, C-E-N-T-S. It doesn't cost that much. There may be um, um, startup costs that may be higher, but in the long term, it really resonates. And I always come back to his perspective on the ground about how, how integration at various levels make um, sense for him. So thank you for, for a really informative uh, conversation today. This has been Webcast Live. It has been recorded. You're on record. So that uh, we will have a video archive of the discussion we will also write a summary of the discussion and all of that will be on our blog platform newsecuritybeat.org so again thank you um, i think this is the start of a conversation on integration and what it means we're particularly pleased to have the opportunity to um, collaborate with our partners at locus and and with you and please join me in thanking the panel Panelists for really engaged conversation. Thank you. Thank you.